Uh, so our next speaker, uh, Dr. Price, had her flight uh, canceled out of um, snowy Boston. So we're going to move on to Dr. Chad Strange from Houston, Texas, who is going to review the uh, imaging of lung cancer after radiotherapy. All right. Good morning. I'm Chad Strange from Houston. So imaging and radiotherapy for lung cancer. And so this is going to be pretty simple. You're reading a CT scan. They've got lung cancer. They've had radiation therapy, and it's a mess. That's the bottom line. So we're going to look at how do we sift through this. We're going to look at the different types of radiation therapy. We're going to look at how those different types of radiation therapy evolve over time, some of the common patterns that we see, and then look at some common complications um, in imaging after radiotherapy. Okay, so you're sitting down, you're looking at a CT scan, they've had cancer, they've had radiation therapy. What are the things you need to be thinking um, as you're trying to sift through this? Number one, where was the primary tumor? You need to look back at the initial image, find out where was the, the original tumor. If you have access to the treatment planning CTs, they are very, very helpful to find out where exactly was the treatment and to find out what exactly was done, what type of radiation therapy were they given. And then you, you need to ask yourself, like, how long, what's the time gap between when they finished radiation therapy and what you're looking at? Because all of those things will play into trying to make sense of what you're looking at. So there's several different types of radiation therapy um, that, that you're probably aware of. There's conventional um, radiation therapy, and then there's a group of newer um, modalities kind of lumped together called high-precision dose, um, but there's several of these that, that lump together. There's 3D conformal radiotherapy, 3D CRT, intensity modulated radiotherapy, IMRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy, SBRT, and proton therapy, and those, those kind of get lumped together because um, especially from an imaging point of view, they tend to give us similar imaging findings. So with conventional radiation therapy, um, the, the thing that you need to remember is while it is easy, there's a lot of normal lung tissue that gets involved. So like if you look at that left image, all of the, the band in red, that's all of the tissue that gets high dose radiation. And so there's a lot of normal lung um, that gets involved. The, the, the other issue with conventional radiation therapy is the doses are reasonably high um, in the 70 gray range, and you're talking seven weeks of therapy. So for patients, um, it's a lot bigger deal. When we look at some of these newer modalities, SBRT is one that you know everyone's familiar with. The, the key is, is the dosing of the radiation is much more compact to the tumor, so there's more of a drop-off so that the normal lung around the tumor is not damaged as much. Um, in general, SBRT is used more for peripheral, smaller tumors, um, especially patients that are not surgical candidates or who don't want surgery. Um, and with those smaller peripheral tumors, doses are quite a bit less than conventional, I mean, in, you know, to the half to th or maybe even a third. Um, you can use SBRT for more central and larger tumors. Radiation doses go up. Um, the other real benefit is you're looking at a couple of weeks of therapy versus seven weeks. So some clear advantages to the patient and to the surrounding lung. Um, when we talk about 3D CRT and IMRT, I, in some ways you can think of these together. They're very similar. They both use CT for planning. Um, the 3D CRT tends to be used more um, for locally um, advanced tumors and operable tumors. It can be used after surgery for, for post-op radiation. Um, but again, less toxicity to surrounding lungs. Um, the IMRT, the, I think the, the one thing about it is it, it uses uh, multi-leaf collimators that more closely um, image around, or treat around the tumor so that if you notice like on that right image, the, the, the concentric circles which demonstrate the decreasing radiation dose as you move out, they're, they're very tight um, around the tumor. So there's just less toxicity um, to the surrounding lung. Proton therapy is a little bit different, but imaging-wise is, is going to be similar for us. Um, if you look at the, the image there on the left, I think it helps some of the understanding. The, the blue line is, is the direction um, of the, and the, where the skin entrance is of the, of the proton therapy. So that's what the blue line is. The red line is radiation dose of conventional radiation therapy. So you notice on that red line, the largest dose is kind of at the entrance, and then it actually drops off. Um, to the tumor. The yellow line is the radiation dose for proton therapy. 
So if you'll notice that at the entrance, there's a lower dose, lower radiation dose at the skin entrance site. It actually increases up to the tumor, and then it just abruptly drops off. And so that phenomenon is called the Bragg peak. But the point is, is that there's a lower entrance dose, there's a higher dose at the tumor, and then an abrupt drop off, which again, so there's less damage to the surrounding lung. Now, so there's all our types. What do you need to remember? It's not so important that you remember each of the different names and how they're different. What's important to remember is with all of these newer modalities of radiation therapy, there's less overall dose, there's much less dose to the surrounding normal lung, and so there's gonna be less damage to the normal lung. So if you just kind of put them in two groups, conventional and newer, that's enough as we move forward trying to figure this out on imaging. So um, let's turn our attention to um, how do these radiation changes evolve over time? What are, what are we expecting to see on CT? And then what are some common patterns that we see? So when we talk about damage to the lung with radiation therapy, we lump those under the term radiation pneumonitis. And that, that doesn't matter whether you're getting conventional radiation therapy or one of the newer um, modalities. It, it's all radiation pneumonitis. And, and you can get areas of consolidation, ground glass opacities, crazy paving, nodular densities. And frankly, you can get all of these in one patient. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. But these are the spectrum of lung damage that we're going to see with radiation therapy. What's different is how it evolves over time. So what you're going to see is going to be the same no matter what. How it evolves over time is very different. With conventional radiation therapy, in general, the radiation pneumonitis is going to start appearing about three months. It's going to peak at about six to 12 months, and it's going to stabilize at about two years. The nice thing about conventional radiation therapy is that stays pretty, pretty standard. I mean, that, that's, that's what you're going to see. With any of the newer modalities, and I'm using SBRT as the example, but this is really true for any of the newer modalities, the radiation pneumonitis, when it shows up, is more variable. 50% of patients will have radiation pneumonitis changes by six months, with another 25% developing by a year. It peaks later at one to two years, and in 50% of patients, even beyond two years, there can be further evolution of the radiation changes. The bottom line that you need to take from that is you need to know what they got, because if it's one of these newer modalities, there's a lot of variability of when it shows up, how it develops, and how long it can keep um, evolving. And so that's, that's why that's so important. So here's an example of just evolution of routine conventional radiation. So in the left image at three months um, post-radiation therapy, you see these patchy ground glass opacities on the left. You see a little bit kind of partially included on the right, the residual tumors there um, with the circle. By six months, you see some coalescing as more radiation fibrotic changes are developing. And let me see if I can get this. And what's really classic with conventional, you see these straight edges. So you get these straight edges where the radiation beam goes through, and you can really pretty clearly delineate. This is damaged lung from radiation. This is normal lung outside that. By two years, it's coalesced down. It's scarred. You see these straight edges. And this is a very routine look of how conventional radiation changes in the lungs develop over time. And I'm actually going to skip that one just in time because I've got a couple of examples here. This is just an example of, of radiation evolution with SBRT. So on the left image, nine months post-therapy, you see this kind of patchy, mass-like area of you know, ground glass consolidative changes. This is the radiation pneumonitis. And, and then you see as it starts evolving, at one year, you kind of see this nodular area. Um, and you just see some, um, some evolving changes. You see some more normal lung kind of coming back in. And then at two years, that mass-like area gets a little bigger. At three years, it's still getting bigger. So you think, well... Is there any possibility, you know, there's tumor recurrence, we got a PET-CT? No, there's no FDG uptake on the PET-CT. This is just evolving radiation changes with SBRT. They can evolve for a long time, even past two years, and we just need to keep that in mind, that, that there's a lot of variety with these newer modalities and how they evolve over time. Now, there's some reasonably characteristic patterns that we see, and, and one of the things that, that I, I want you to take from this is these patterns are going to look like things that you see every day in non-cancer patients. And that's hugely important because these post-radiation CTs, I think, often get misinterpreted because we see these patterns and we, we just think other things. So one of the ways that, that radiation pneumonitis can show up, it can show up as a halo pattern, reverse halo pattern, just like we see in other things. 
Um, it can show up as a patchy pattern. So here you have, like on the lower right image, you've got this kind of patchy consolidative where you've got you know, ground glass and alveolar opacities mixed up with, with normal lung. Now, here's the thing. If you're not looking at any images and I say to you, I've got a CT scan and I've got a halo pattern, a reverse halo pattern or a patchy pattern, you're thinking, well, that sounds just like pneumonia. That sounds just like organizing pneumonia. That sounds just like drug reaction, right? It looks exactly the same. And it's why it's so important that we know where was that primary tumor, where were they treated, how long ago were they treated, what were they treated with, because these patterns for radiation can look just like other things. And we don't want to look at this and go, well, it looks like pneumonia. Because it's not. And so these patterns can look a lot like different things. Um, the modified conventional pattern is just where you get you know, as, as the name would imply, um, findings that look like conventional radiation therapy, the straight lines, the architectural distortion, but it's less exuberant. And so, um, you know, it's a smaller area, but you still get, you know, the straight lines here um, like you would get with conventional. We can get a mass-like pattern. This gets very tricky with people. Um, on that lower left baseline image, this is a right upper lobe obstructing tumor. It was treated with proton therapy. You've got the proton um, um, treatment planning CT. And on that third image, you see, you know, at two years after the completion of radiation therapy, you see this kind of mass-like area of consolidation of the right hilum. But at four years, it's even bigger. Well, remember, with all of these newer modalities, you can get continued evolution of changes even after two years. And so this was just continued evolution of this mass-like pattern. Um, and so we don't want to just look at that and go, oh, it, it looks like a mass. It's getting bigger. It must be recurrence because this is an expected um, one of the expected patterns that we can see. The final pattern is just a scar-like pattern. So this was a left apical tumor that was treated with SBRT. And the scar-like pattern, you know, it looks like a scar. It's usually less than a centimeter wide, and it has a scar-like appearance. Now, again, as we briefly stop here, is it so important that you remember the names of all the patterns? Not really. Is it so important that you remember the exact evolution, you know, when things turn up? Not so much. What's important is that you remember, especially with newer modality radiation therapy, there's a lot of variety. It can show up later than you think. It can persist longer than you think. And it can look like a lot of other things. And if you just keep all that in mind, it really helps from just jumping to conclusions. Last thing I want to look at are some complications, some common complications of radiation therapy. Um, certainly the most dreaded complication is recurrence. So we talked about, you know, you've got this mass-like pattern. It can look like recurrence. It can, but there's also real recurrence. So what kind of things are we looking at that, that increase the risk um, that there's actual tumor recurrence? Any growth is concerning, especially if it's sequential, especially if it's past 12 months. Now, we talked about these changes can persist past 12 months or even two years, and we've talked about a mass-like pattern can be normal, but those things should catch our attention. So persistent growth, sequential growth, enlargement over 12 months, um, a bulging margin or loss of a linear margin, loss of air bronchograms, um, or craniocaudal growth of 5 millimeters or more than 20%. We, we take these things together um, to assess, you know, is there a chance that there's actual tumor recurrence. And this is what it looks like. So on the lower left image, this was a patient that had a um, right upper lobe tumor. There's uh, right hilar and right subcarinal adenopathy. You can see in the second image, this patient was treated with IMRT. So there's the treatment planning CD. And nine months post-therapy, you get some pretty characteristic changes. So you've got this area of, of scarring. There's some traction bronchiectasis. This might be what we talked about, the modified conventional pattern. It's got a nice straight line here. But that's really what you would expect. That's a, that's a normal look. But then you look at 15 months. So I've got the axial and the coronal at 15 months. And you see this area here in the middle. And you start thinking to yourself, I used to have an air bronchogram sitting right there. And it's gone. There's soft tissue now filling that air bronchogram. I used to have a nice straight line, and now I have a bulging line. I've lost that straight margin. And then on the coronal, you can see that clearly that's more than five millimeters of growth there. So you take these things together and you think, this bothers me. These things together bother me. So we got a PET CT. It's obviously hypermetabolic. It was biopsy. This was recurrent tumor. And so these are the things that we're looking at to try to assess for recurrence. I'm not going to go over that. As you know, PET CT is where we go. If, if there's a concern for recurrence after radiation therapy, PET CT is going to help us assess for recurrence and help guide biopsies. It's clearly better than CT. 
The second complication um, after radiation therapy that I want you to be aware of is radiation recall pneumonitis. And so what this basically is, is this is an area of inflammation that is in the area of the radiation treatment plan after some new agent has been added and it's generally immunotherapy. And so what we see in this on that lower left image, um, there was a treated tumor. And so in the posterior paramediastinal area, you've got these areas of you know, consolidative change. That's the radiation pneumonitis. So our treatment field was, was posterior. And at seven months, you still see a little bit but there's actually some evolution of those changes. And at 15 months, um, patient was, uh, immunotherapy was added, and so you see these new areas of consolidation. And so these are areas of consolidation that are in the radiation treatment field after a new agent was added. And so we don't want to look at this and say, well, they've got bibasilar pneumonia. We want to look at this and say, this is recall pneumonitis. Um, it's, it's, the, the mechanisms are related to reactivation of cytokines and thing like, things like that. Um, the, generally, especially with immunotherapy, um, the median time to development is about 60 days. So after the immunotherapy agent has been added, it's about 60 days, but there's actually a wide variety. I mean, it can be as short as a week and as long as a year after. Um, but, but 60 days is, is kind of the average. So we want to be aware of this um, as just a known complication after radiation therapy. The last thing, um, last complication is thrombus in situ. And this was actually first described by a couple of my colleagues at Anderson um, recently, um, Dr. Zahuja and Shroff. But this is important because we want to be able to tell thrombus in situ and we want to differentiate that from PE because these are very, very different phenomena. So thrombus in situ is a non-occlusive thrombus generally in a single artery there's generally obtuse margins, but, but it's a single artery in the radiation treatment field, and that's key. And so you got to look back and you say, okay, here's my MRT treatment field, and this is a non-occlusive thrombus that is in a vessel that is in the radiation treatment field, and it is a vessel that is supplying lung that has radiation pneumonitis, and that's key. What is interesting is in the study of this, the majority of these do not embolize. So we see them, they're there, they generally don't cause much trouble. And so this is obviously for the clinical team, but a lot of these patients, they don't even anticoagulate. I mean, some they do, but, but many they don't. And so um, there's, a, there's a variety of mechanisms. There's probably some direct radiation injury to the endothelium, to the vasoforum. There's probably some accelerated atherosclerosis. There's probably a component of stasis um, because this artery is, is supplying lung with radiation pneumonitis. Um, and so probably all of those play together. But the key is single vessel, non-occlusive, in the treatment field, supplying lung that has radiation pneumonitis. And so if we see those together, we can say this is most likely thrombus in situ, which is different than PE. Okay, if we wrap this all together, we're sitting back down again, we're looking at a CT, it's a lung cancer patient, they may have had surgery, they may have had immunotherapy, they've had radiation therapy, and these CTs can be a mess. And we see all these changes and we're trying to decide, do they just have pneumonia, do they have recurrent tumor? These are the things that if we put together, help this make sense. We look back, what radiation technique did they get? Did they get conventional or one of the newer modalities? We need to know that um, because that helps us determine what are the expected, what is the expected evolution of these radiation changes? You know, are the changes that you're looking at on the CT, are they exactly where the tumor and the treatment plan was? You know, so can we chalk this up to radiation or is it something different? And what's the expected temporal evolution? So if we put all those things together, we can make this make sense. The last thing is, I mean, you only see what you know. You only see what you know. And so knowing the complications after radiation therapy help us see things. So do I see things that look like tumor recurrence? Do I see things that are high risk for tumor recurrence and do we need to get a PET or a biopsy? Um, do I see um, areas of consolidation that are in the treatment field after immunotherapy? You know, so it looks like recall pneumonitis. Um, or you know, do we see this in situ pulmonary thrombus? So being aware of these things in this scenario Taking all of our prior information helps us make sense of these CTs and actually be clinically helpful. So that's all I've got. If you've got any questions, please feel free to contact me. Here's